Um, yes, it will get better when you remember to, to see the worry as worry. Yes. Then you can say, oh, I don't have to worry. Let me stop worry and think of Dhamma. Think about being happy. Yes. Okay, when you're thinking about the Dhamma, then that's a wholesome thought. If you're worried about the Dhamma, then that's an unwholesome thought. Yes. And so if you can see that worrying, even worrying about the Dhamma is an unwholesome thought, we can change it and say, wow, the Dhamma is great. Well, I remember what Damaranto said. Well, I, mean, I can I, reflect about how much joy it gives. So you start thinking about the Dhamma, start remembering the teachings that I've given you. Start teaching it to yourself. That in fact, repeating favorite phrases over and over and over again, just like the monks chant. Repeating those phrases over and over again. Everything's going to be all right. No place to go and nothing to do and everything's going to be okay. You keep repeating those phrases. That's Dhamma. But if you keep thinking thoughts like, oh, am I getting it right? Oh, my feelings are not as great as I want them to be. Then those are unwholesome thoughts. Yes. And remember that the first thing that you said, you started this whole conversation out is about I'm worried about and I cut you off right then. I don't even care what it is that you're worried about. The fact is, is that I can see you worried and you use the word and can't see that you're worried. Yes. It takes a worried I mean, man to sing a worried song. Have you heard that before? Takes a worried uh, man to sing a worried song, and here you are singing a worried song. <laughs> but you can fix that up by saying, Yeah, but I ain't going to be worried long. Put a stop to that. You're worried now, but you can stop it. You ain't going to be worried long. Um, and was, you this, remember to look to see that you're worried. We've talked about this before. And you come back with a new worry. Doesn't matter what the worry is. The fact is, kid, you stop it. And just have happy, wholesome thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just the choice of word I use to facilitate. Yeah, I something. hear them. <laughs> I hear your choice of words. Yeah. It's just. The question is, can you hear your choice of words? Instead of trying to make even choicier words to get your point across, can you see that those choicy words you're using are unwholesome? Mm hmm. And then you can change it. Um, it's almost it's almost like there's a certain word I use to make sure I come across as polite. Pardon? But I I mean there's a certain word I use to make sure I come across as polite. Um, that's what I was saying. Um, you don't have to be polite with me. I'm not polite with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, that's kind of the question I, I I've been wanting to ask, which is, uh, sometime there's a there's a sangha on this call. Um, well, th there's one where DJ and Michael was in, which is uh, your server. And then there was another Sangha, uh, which, um, well, long story short, sometimes I feel like helping people, maybe 
really just out of uh, generosity. And I would say something and then people find it dismissive as in, actually my, my question is just, I, I feel like that me wanting to help people sometimes is just not wholesome because the interaction was just turn out unwholesome. And I feel like I feel like an idiot trying to help people. <laughs> yes. OK, let's talk about that. Yeah. All right. Here's first off, you can't help anyone. I agree. So can you now that you agree, can you cheer up about it? Can you cheer up to where you know you can't help anyone? Yes. All right. Yeah. The only that, people it's like you found out that you can only are the only one who can help yourself. Can you recognize that you can't help anyone? That guy that you're trying to help, the only one that can help him is himself. Yes. Yes. OK. The second point is, is that in our culture. Even in Malaysian culture, the word help is a positive word and a better way of looking at it is oh it's not so positive because it's often rejected your help is going to be rejected because it's negative anyway i agree okay so don't try to help anybody but you can share your joy yes. and that may piss some people off <laughs> because they don't want to be joyful. Yes. And and we know that they don't want to be joyful because you've already gotten yourself into the vision of you want to help them. Help them. Why do you want to help them? I agree. Why do you want to help them, though? Is because they're not joyful. Is that right? They're in a misery yes. and you want to help them out of misery. Yes. OK, jumping into their misery pool with them is not going to help them. That's going to piss them off. Yes. And standing on the ship and, and laughing at them without jumping in to help them is going to piss them off. Yes. All right. So what's the right thing to do? Well, the analogy is, is to throw them a life buoy that's got a lifeline or a rope so that you hold one end of the rope and throw them a life buoy. And when they grab a hold of it, then and only after they pull get grab a hold of it, can you start to pull them in? You yes. can throw them a life buoy and they'll get pissed off at that, too. <laughs> so there's no reason to pull that in <laughs> unless they've already grabbed hold of it and they want it. Yes, yes. OK, so often yes. when you throw them a joyful life buoy, they they uh, mistakenly think that you're still on the boat, which you are, and just laughing at them rather than throwing them a lifeline. Yes, but it's only up always up to them as to whether they see what you're doing as useful, valuable and wholesome to them or not in their own context. Mm -hmm. And so this is where the wisdom comes in. The wisdom is, is that sometimes, in fact, one of the things that I find quite often is, is that somebody comes wanting to argue with me. <laughs> or I'll make a statement and they don't understand it. So instead of saying, please clarify, they'll start arguing with me about it. Yes, uh, that's what happened. Right. Uh -huh. An example of that would be. What about the gradual method? And my first statement will be the gradual method is for losers. <laughs> and one will stay a, glad, a gradual uh, progressor. And as long as they're progressing slowly, they're still a loser. I mean, isn't that clear and obvious? OK. <laughs> all right. But they'll argue. About all well, there is the slow approach, and the answer to that is is that when you change your mind about can you do it now, 
rather than postponing and and staying yes. in your misery, making progress in your misery, and start <laughs> being happy right now. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> that's where you have to come to is to get them to believe that it's okay for them to be happy right now. It's okay for them to take that life preserver, and then you're going to just pull them right in and cheer them right up. Yes. Right here, right now. Yes. Within the next 10 to 20 seconds, you can cheer them up if they're willing to be cheered up. Just like you are, you're willing to be cheered up, and that's why I can throw you that lifeline. Do you know that you were worried when you first called, and here you are just howling with laughter? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's really funny. <laughs> it's, it's hard not to laugh. Okay, so yeah. this is the approach. When you get yourself back into howling with laughter, only then can you actually help them. Yes, yes. So there's where the wisdom comes in, is, is that, yeah, you can throw them the life draft, but they may refuse it. But you keep talking, you keep throwing the life draft, and then when they grab hold of it, finally, now you can pull them in. But commonly what happens is, is that people jump in with them. They go right into the misery. Yes. And then... And then I would feel misery too once I jump in. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you recognize you can't help anybody. The only way <laughs> and the the help that they need to give themselves is to grab hold of that life draft. If they don't yeah. grab hold of it, if they don't take the active action to to grab something, a hold of it that you're willing to give them, then there's no way that you can pull them in. Yes. I it really got me thinking about how Buddha help people. Um is it fair to say he don't spend much time arguing? It's fair to say I do not spend much time arguing. Yeah. And in fact more recently I would say that I am downright rude in their opinion because I won't argue with them. Yeah. Like for instance, somebody will say, I, I'm, well, I'm making a point here. And the answer to that is I'm not interested in your points. And then he'll rephrase it to, the, to saying something like, uh, oh, well, I'm trying to ask a question. And so my answer to that would be, well, ask the question and stop trying to make points with me. Yes. You're not going to get any points done, but if you got a question, you can make a, you can ask a question. Yes. All right. So this is how you begin to deal with people is by not putting up with, they're wanting to argue and tell you that your life raft or life boy is not good enough yet. <laughs> I agree. It's yeah. I it, it kind of reminds me of um. I I mean, I, I don't read enough sutra, but it, it seems like Buddha himself often is quite direct with what he's trying to say. I mean, he he was yes, he to, was quite direct. Yeah. And he was also good at not letting people argue with him. Yeah. That in fact, what he would do instead is say something that shocked them. Some of the stuff he said was really shocking. You want to give a couple of examples of that? Yeah. Okay. They're in India in the time of the Buddha and still in certain pockets of India, mostly practiced by a group of, of people who were very close to the Jain system, will practice really strange austerities. Yes. Okay. One would be the cacao, uh, the cow duty aesthetic, 
which means that he lives in a, that you could even have a pig do the aesthetic. I don't think that they have those, but the, the way of a cow do the aesthetic is to go live with the cows. Walk around in the cow pen, which has got cow dung. Yes. Moo like a cow. Eat with the cows. And the one that's even more weird is the dog duty aesthetic, which means that they walk mostly uh, crawling around on all fours. They eat food only on a, uh, off the ground or only out of a plate if the plate's on the ground. Yes. Okay, and and both of the cow duty aesthetic and the dog duty aesthetic are generally around, walking around naked in public, which is allowed in India because they've been doing it for centuries, dozens of centuries, millennia even. Okay, and so the dog duty aesthetic goes to the Buddha mm -hmm. and ask a question about it, and the Buddha was very, very, very direct in the sense that he says is that. If you continue doing the dog duty aesthetic and you are successful, you will become a dog. Yes. Or in their way of talking about it, you will be reborn as a dog. Mm -hmm. And if you fail at being a dog, practicing mm -hmm. the dog duty aesthetic, then you mm -hmm. will wind up in hell. Those are yes. your two choices, is to become a dog or to go to hell. Mm. And they said the same thing to the cow duty aesthetic. And so that when that happened, one of them started bawling. One started crying. Mm. He couldn't stand the fact that the Buddha was right. That Yeah, he's dooming himself to either becoming a dog or he's going to go to hell. And so he was ready to, to hear the Dhamma. And this is when the Buddha actually gives his disposition about Kama. Why? Because that's what the dog duty aesthetic is really all about. He's trying to pretend to be something that he is not in order to do the austerity, in order to burn off all of the old bad Kama. But by acting like a dog now, he's actually creating new bad Kama, not burning off old bad Kama. Because that's why people do those crazy things. They're trying to improve themselves. They're trying to get out of the predicament that Kama has put in, them into. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to burn off old bad Kama. And what they're doing instead is creating new bad Kama. <sighs> yes. Yes. Right. So if that's the case, then we can begin to see that there are more than just two kinds of karma. There is the karma that is good, that gives good results. That's why people are generous. That's why they're kind hearted. That's why they mm. give to the church. That's why they do altruistic things. And then there is bad action that gives bad results. And that's what most people are taught to do. Work too yes. hard, steal money, lie, cheat, all of that kind of stuff. But I tell you, yes. there is more. Mm -hmm. There is also, in fact, the most common action of all has both dark and bright results. So therefore, the action itself is both dark and bright. I see. OK, and we have that commonly in our society, like the cloud has a silver lining. Mm. Or things weren't so bad after all that things were mixed, that doctors, in fact, practice medicine with mixed motivations. Oh. Yeah, the practice of medicine is done with mixed motivations. And people will say, oh, well, the doctors are really good people because they're trying to help people. And the answer <laughs> to that is often the doctors will give medicine to somebody knowing that it's a placebo. He's yes. not trying to cure the person because he has no cure. He's trying to get the person to cure themselves by lying to them, giving them a pill. Maybe they believe in it. They also doctors have um, uh, a mixed comma in the sense that they often charge too much. They pay too little attention to charge too much money. 
and yes. give no value. Yes. And so the practice of medicine is a mixed bag. And that's exactly what you're doing when you're trying to help people. You've got mixed motives. You yes. think that, in fact, you'll feel better if you can get that guy to feel better, and you can't make him feel better, so you wind up feeling bad yourself. Yeah, it's, it's also less about me not having to help. It's more that they perceive my intention as something else. Which, but, yeah, basically what you said earlier. As in, yeah. All right. But, yeah, it is a mixed bag, yeah. Yes, so almost all action is mixed, mixed comma. Doctors don't practice medicine purely altruistically. Even altruistic organizations do not practice altruistically. In fact, what happens is, and I'll give you a good example of the Red Cross. You've heard of the Red Cross, obviously. It's in, uh, you have it also, the Red Crescent. Both of them are in Malaysia. Mm. Okay, the Red Cross spends 80% of their income advertising and paying salaries, and only 20% of their income goes to doing the original good work that they were doing. So they've got a mixed bag of about 80-20. Yes. 80% selfish and only 20% altruistic. Why is that? Because the people who work for the Red Cross is most more important for them for the Red Cross to survive than it is for the Red Cross to do its job. Mm. If the Red Cross was only intended to do its job, it would waste all its resources in doing its job and it wouldn't survive. Yes. The bureaucracy wouldn't get paid, they'd quit and go someplace else. Mm -hmm. And so we put up with the Red Cross because at least 20% of the money they take in does something of value. Okay, so now that you understand that almost everything is done in a mixed bag, that's what was happening to the dog duty aesthetic. That in fact, he thought he was doing good where in fact he was not. He was doing himself harm. All right. So now that we understand that, let's talk about a fourth kind of comma. Yes. And the fourth kind of comma, according to the Buddha, and by the way, all of this that I'm talking to you about is in a sutta number 57 in the Majjhima Nikaya, and it's okay. called the dog duty aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can go read this sutta if you want. Yes, 57. Okay. Uh-huh, number 57. The dog mm. duty aesthetic. So let's talk about the real point because that real point really applies to you. Yes. Okay. The fourth kind of comma is neither bright nor dark and gives results that neither bright nor dark, but it does lead to the end of action. It does lead to the end of comma. And in fact, it also does lead to nothing, which is liberation. Yes. Okay. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. And so when your actions become just actions, they're not bright, they're not dark, and the results are not bright and not dark. So let's figure out what that means. Okay. If they're not dark, that means that the things that you're doing is not harming anyone. Yes. They may harm themselves, but you're not harming anyone. You're throwing that life trap out there. But if an ordinary person throws that life raft out there and somebody doesn't grab onto it, they're going to feel bad. Oh, I threw you a life preserver and you didn't even take it. Yes. But if you can, in fact, talk to people mm -hmm. without expecting any results from them at all, Yes. Without expecting any results at all, that your actions are just merely actions and they don't have any consequences mm. for you to judge as good or bad. Yes. Whatever consequences are just consequences without you judging it. Okay. Which means then that you're not harming people. So it's, it's not dark. 
And because you're not doing things to harm people, the harm that they get is not your action, it's their own. Yes. But also, you threw that life graph without expecting anything. Mm. Okay, so your good actions are neither good anymore. They're just actions mm. now. You see, oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw that guy a life graph. And if he takes it, that's okay. And if he doesn't take it, that's okay. Yes. But the whole point about karma is always later. It's mm -hmm. past and future oriented. So if you throw a life graph to this guy and he takes it right now, you can enjoy the benefit of it right now without having any future issues. The whole point like for that would be, oh, I'm in heaven now and God is judging me. And I say, well, I threw that guy a life draft. Uh -huh. right? So we expect to, to have more than just whether he took it. Now, he didn't take it, but at least I did something good. Right. Mm. And guess what? You may not get any results at all. Yes. So begin to do some things then without expression, expectations of the outcomes. And this is especially true when you're trying to help someone. Because mm. if you can help them, you will feel good and they will too. But if you can't help them, then you will feel bad and so will they. Can you go and do what you're going to do without expectations of whether you're helping or not? Um, I, I just want to understand a bit better. So, like, usually it's like if someone is saying something and I, I feel it's nice to contribute my point of view, really, I wasn't really expecting whether they get better or not. It's just, I, I just want to say it. And then someone just suddenly out of nowhere, uh, they come and argue with me, even though I wasn't asking for any argument. Uh -huh. How should I react? Should I just let it be and ignore them? Well, no, and... you can tell them I'm not, I'm not interested in arguing. Yes. And you can yes. do it cheerfully. Maintain your cheerfulness, even when they're not taking your life raft. Your joy is up to you, not up to your actions and the results of your actions. Your yes. joy is up to you. Mm. And so you go do what you're going to do without expecting any results. Yes. Now, the thing that is really amazing is, is that uh, over time, if you still keep uh, dealing with these guys, and if you know them, you'll, they'll be around. You keep doing them life grabs, eventually they're going to grab hold of it. Yes. But that's still up to them. Yes. It's not up to you. So, in a way, you're saying, you're, the, the question you have is, is that, oh, I want to help people. How can I do that? And my answer is, forget it. You can't help anybody, but you can maintain your own joy. You can maintain your cheerfulness. You can be downright happily rude. Because that shocks them and wakes them up. What is this thing? Is this a life graph or what? <laughs> How dare you throw things at me when I want you to come in and join my pity party? <laughs> it really feels that way. Like they just want to want you to jump inside with them. It's weird. Yeah, that's the way that the Buddha handles it. He's going to shock them. He's going to throw them something and they say, what the heck is this? And I have seen time after time after time, not 100% of the time, but time after time, I'll hit somebody hard with something and they stop arguing with me and start listening. And that all had happens within an hour. I'll let them go for 20 minutes or so and then I'll start hitting them.
So you could do that too. You don't have an hour. Maybe you've got several days over, you know, bits and pieces of course of time. But don't expect any results. But have fun throwing life rafts. Have fun throwing life preservers. <laughs> just that imaginary like makes me laugh. Like I'm just throwing it. <laughs> 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 I'm just throwing life on and then I'm just having fun here. I just Yeah, I'm just having fun. I don't care whether you get any saving <laughs> or not. I don't care whether you drown in your own misery. <laughs> I'm just having fun here. It, it makes so much sense. Um I I've been reflecting on some of how Buddha himself helped people. It it really feels like there's this air of like he's just he's just in his own joyfulness like even though he's helping he's not like going down there with them it's it's really amazing thank you yeah. good to see you again ivan yes we'll see you this weekend too Okay, see you. Uh, thank you. Right. Bye -bye. You go have fun. Don't try to help them. Just have fun throwing life rafts. <laughs> okay, I will. All right. See you. Bye -bye. We'll see you. Bye-bye.